First and foremost, thank you all so much for coming and welcome to the White House. My name is Bess Evans. I am the Public Engagement Advisor in the Office of Science and Technology Policy and in the Office of Public Engagement. We are thrilled that you have joined us today um, for this amazing Champions of Change celebration. Just a reminder to everyone, this event this morning is live streamed. Um, and so as a courtesy to not only the folks in the room, but the thousands of folks that are watching on the internet, if you could turn off your cell phones, uh, just so we can hear the wonderful stories of our champions this morning. Restrooms, as many of you have probably already discovered, are right out this door. Take a left for the gentlemen's room and a right for the ladies' room. I'll be sitting in the back if you have any questions. Um, and thank you all so much for coming uh, and coming to the White House to celebrate these amazing champions with us. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce it to someone who I'm sure you all know well. Um, and let's give her a big round of applause for all of the effort that she's put into this event. Joan Fry, who is a senior policy analyst in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Thank you, Bess. Um, I want to welcome everyone here to the White House uh, and uh, want, want to welcome the, our, our champions of change, our audience members, our federal uh, representatives from the federal funding agencies, and my colleagues at OSTP and in the White House. Welcome. Um, I, as Bess mentioned, this event is live streamed at www.whitehouse.gov slash live. Um, People, audience members, are encouraged to tweet during the event using hashtag um, pound sign WHChamps and I guess hashtag, you can tell I'm giving my age away, hashtag open science. And also I encourage you and um, audience members to check out uh, whitehouse.gov slash champions for more information on the champions' bios and their blog posts. Bios, I believe, are already up. The blog posts will be posted shortly. Um, it is my, um, uh, before I introduce our opening speaker, I want to invite audience members to submit questions. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end for about 10 or 15 minutes, depending on time. And there are cards in the uh, foyer to my left um, that um, you can write down your question. There will be, uh, Ms. Rubin will be collecting questions, distributing cards, um, throughout the program, and I will remind you of that uh, shortly, so please don't be shy. It is my pleasure to introduce Philip Rubin, who is the um, Principal Assistant Director for Science in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. He will be making opening remarks. Philip, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Again, welcome to the White House. It's a pleasure and honor to welcome you to the White House Champions of Change event on citizen science. On behalf of President Obama and Dr. John Holdren, the President's Science Advisor, I want to welcome everyone in this auditorium and also all of those who are watching this event remotely. And I especially want to uh, welcome our citizen science champions of change. Our champions are being recognized today because of the tremendous impact that they and their organizations have had in engaging the non-expert in the scientific enterprise. They're involving fellow citizens in monitoring air quality or the populations of species such as butterflies, coastal birds and plants that are especially vulnerable to climate change or pollution or even near-Earth asteroids. They're inspiring kids to focus uh, on searching for fossils or introducing our citizens to neuroscience. They're increasing access to instruments usually found only in high-end research labs. They're engaged in the maker movement, the do-it-yourself movement, and uh, also new advances in 3D printing and fabrication they include our veterans, our youth who might not appreciate the natural world due to lack of access to parks, and many others who are not usually participating in science. They're engaging our citizens across the lifespan, preschoolers as well as elders in their 90s. All of our champions are being honored this morning for significantly improving general science literacy in our nation, 
which is critically important as many of the policy decisions of today require at least some understanding of the underlying science and technology issues. Whether we're talking about climate change, genetically modified foods, antibiotic use in animals raised for human consumption, cybersecurity, vaccinations, other health-related issues, or even things like fracking. More and more scientists today are engaging the broader public in their research, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the only thing to do. They're finding that they have to involve the broader citizenry because the necessary data to be collected are dispersed over too large a geographical area, or the time commitment would be overwhelming if only experts were analyzing the data. The beauty of citizen science is that it is so broad. Every discipline can use extra hands, can figure out what kind of training is needed to make sure people provide useful data, can truth check the data, can challenge the participants to develop the hypothesis, experimental plan and design, and can acknowledge and celebrate their contributions. The champions of change that we're recognizing today are doing exactly that. An increasing number of future jobs will be based in science, technology, engineering, and math, also known as STEM. A recent Brookings Institute report indicates that as of 2011, 20% of all jobs require a high level of knowledge in a STEM field. And those STEM jobs that do not require a four-year degree pay 10% higher wages than non-STEM jobs. We have to get the message out that one does not have to be a genius or have a PhD to do science. As a country, we cannot cannot afford to propagate the myth that science is for the elite top few percent, that it's not for the ordinary person. The champions of change that we're celebrating today are the standard bearers for that message. Involving average citizens in science is important for at least one other reason. Continuing U.S. leadership in STEM. Today, in many STEM fields, domestic graduate students are in the minority and the number of undergraduates choosing STEM majors is declining. Dep despite some improvements, U.S. performance in the trends in international mathematics and science study continued to lag relative to many European and Asian countries. The President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, which we refer to as PCAST, reported in February 2012 that fewer than 40% of students who enter college intending to major in a STEM field complete a STEM degree. If we could increase the retention of STEM majors from just 40% to 50%, three quarters of a million additional STEM degrees would be awarded over the next decade. Economic projections indicate that the U.S. needs approximately one million additional STEM professionals in the next decade to maintain our leadership in STEM. So retention is key. To achieve that goal, we must encourage our youth to discover the wonders of science and to sustain that interest and excitement so that they, uh, so that they take the challenging courses in middle and high school that prepare them to excel when they get to college. As you'll hear from the champions today, they are providing exactly the kinds of opportunities that turn our youth on to science and capture their imagination. In closing, I want to recognize the federal agency representatives who are here today. Many of them manage programs that support citizen science efforts and are very eager to hear what the wonderful champions have been up to. After our formal Champions of Change event concludes, there'll be a short break, and then we'll reconvene upstairs in the Indian Treaty Room on the fourth floor to hear about new federal initiatives in citizen science. Champions, their guests, and audience members are all welcome to participate in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. It is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's event, Joe Palka. Joe Palka is an award-winning science correspondent with 
NPR. He's reported on a wide variety of topics. In fact, his young children once asked what he reported on, and he replied, Mars, SARS, and stars. <laughs> and that about covers it, as well as pretty much everything in between. He's also known for his work as backup host for Science Friday. So we would like to welcome and applaud Joe Pelt. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can I ask the first panel of champions to come up? I hope you know who you are, but if you don't, I can say your names. Julia Parrish, Harry Gentry, Michael Cohn, Dolores Hill, Sandra Henderson, and Greg Gage, Gregory Gage. Um, we don't have a lot of time. I've asked to be brief, so brief I shall be. Uh, I'd first like to introduce and ask to come to the podium Julia Parrish to talk about COAST, the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team. Thanks, Jay. COAST started in 1998 with 12 volunteers uh, in Ocean Shores, Washington. And those 12 people were going out on the beach monthly to literally pick up dead birds and figure out what species they were and report that back to me at the University of Washington. Now, 15 years later, COAST has 850 people walking the beaches from Eureka, California, north to Kotzebue, Alaska, and west to the Commander Islands, which are in Russia, right at the end of the Aleutian Island chain. COAST has identified 160 species, has uh, found over 30,000 carcasses identified to species. Pretty geeky, I realize. And we've used that data to uh, figure out what's going on with fishery bycatch, to document harmful algal blooms, to look at avian influenza, to look at the effects of climate warming, and to look at historic use of seabirds by Native Americans as food sources. Coast is Kathleen Wolgamuth, an 80-year-old uh, from Ocean Shores, now battling cancer, still out on the beach uh, every month with her daughter, Beth. Coast is Robert Ollie Olakainen uh, from Tillamook, Oregon who, uh, an avid Huskies fan, and I hope he's watching, um, has uh, literally scooped up the whole town um, to volunteer with him uh, and actually made a dead bird float in the 4th of July parade. <laughs> Coast is Olivia Vitale, age 15, started at age 12, um, surveys with her dad, Don, um, on Bainbridge Island and put her first bird uh, find on YouTube. Uh, Coast is Daniel Ravenel from Tahola, Washington, who works for the Quinault Tribal uh, Nation, Department of Natural Resources, surveys with his dog Denali um, when he's not uh, in the Coast Guard uh, Reserves coming from a military family. And what brings those people together? It's not their age or their race or their ethnicity. It's not their politics or their education level. It's not their job or their gender. It's that they have a very, very strong sense of place. They love their place. They want to know about it. They worry about it. And by Participating in citizen science, in rigorous citizen science, they know they can gather the data, they can work with scientists, and together we can make a difference because only with that very broad extent, fine-grained data, can we solve the environmental problems that face us today. So science is important, but people are important too, and the world is changing very fast, and there are just too many issues and problems for scientists to deal with alone. So we need an army and we need a village. Last century was the century of ivory tower science, where you had to have a PhD to be a scientist. But this century, this century is the century of citizen science, where everybody, everybody in this room, everybody who's watching, everybody in the country, everybody in the world, can be part of a science team and make a difference. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Julia. I, I wonder if anybody else had trouble parsing that dead bird float. <laughs> I'm sinking of an ice cream drink all of a sudden. Oh, no. so. Ouch. Um, next, I'd like to ask Ari Gentry from BioCurious to come to the podium. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Ari Gentry, and I'm the founder and president of BioCurious. It's the world's largest and first hackerspace devoted to biology. 
And I'm not a scientist, nor do I play one on TV. <laughs> and I don't want to say necessarily that I am, because like Julia mentioned, you don't have to convince people that you're a scientist to do good work. And I thank you so much for having me here to say that what we're doing is working. Um, I'm here in large part because when I wanted, when I finally realized that I wanted to do science, I found it really, really, really hard. And a lot of my challenges led to empathy at helping other people get involved. Um, knowing what it's like to be a young person, a non-scientist, a non-academic, kind of a strange person altogether, and sometimes even a girl, you face challenges that don't let people accept you when you say you want to do something. Um, with BioCurious itself, I ended up asking a lot of people to try to do this project on their own, and then I asked people for advice. In every case, it ended up being a no, it doesn't make enough money, or we have to turn it into something that the world has seen before. It was hard to think of doing a completely volunteer-run lab like we have today. So let me go back and tell you about some of my challenges first, and then how BioCurious is rocking the world of science today. I, so I grew up in a little town in Arizona wanting to be a stockbroker, but a scientist and inventor and everything. And being a dreamer didn't really cause a lot of problems until I got to college and somebody says, well, you've got to be practical and make decisions for your life. So I did. And I was practical and I decided I wanted to be an investment banker and that I was going to be a really great student and go on to make a lot of money in finance and hopefully funnel that into helping the world somehow down the road. Um, being a pretty impatient person and having the not too uncommon ability to see when people aren't happy with what they're working on. I was quickly disillusioned with finance, did some soul searching and found that my true interests were in science, research, and medicine. I remember looking, staying up um, many, many nights, um, looking for information about my dad's condition. Um, he didn't know what was going on. He'd had multiple surgeries and seen doctors, spent so much money trying to figure out what was causing him pain and suffering. And I found so many of the answers in online patient forums where the individual is the expert of their own condition. They work within the system, but they know that they've got to do it on their own. And that was the first glimpse that I had into the power of the individual to take control of science, medicine, in this case, their own lives. Um, this story isn't about medicine, although that's a big part of my life. Um, that's just a thread that runs through the rest of my work, the power of the individual. Um, and I realized that um, I needed to do something. Eventually, um, do I have a second? Okay. Um, I didn't realize that was going to be so long. I apologize. So I wanted to say that I met scientists, people, and wannabe scientists like myself who didn't have a way to get involved, and they had some common needs for space, people, and low-cost equipment. We decided that a hackerspace was the perfect model for it, and when nobody else would do it, um, some friends and I decided to open up 2,600 square foot space in Sunnyvale, where membership is just $100 a month compared to the three to $6,000 average for other biotech labs in the area. We have six-year-olds working alongside their parents, working on genetic modification, making bacteria glow. We have entrepreneurs working there, postdocs finally finding a place to get teaching experience. And we have requests from around the world to open labs in their neighborhood, too. Thank you. Next, I'd like to ask Michael Cohen to come up and talk about the American Kestrel Project, Soldiers to Scientists. Um, it's tough to know where to start, and I want to keep it brief, but uh, I think, I think uh, there's several important points that we'll probably all bring up in a different way, and a lot of it surrounding uh, citizen science. Um, my work, personally, is with um, the American Kestrel Project and uh, a great deal of programs with Cornell Ornithology Lab. Um, and uh, I started it at a business park in Centerville. Um, but the, the real thrust of probably why I'm here today is because citizen science and the activities that surround it, um, the accessibility, um, the ability for whether you like fish, whether you like birds, whether you like bugs or the outdoors, 
there's an app for that. And um, you can do it on the road, and you can uh, instantly communicate with other like-minded individuals. And I think we're not yet uh, fully aware of the, the psychological and sociological benefits of just time outdoors, and then adding meaning to that, and adding some purpose, and adding something outside of yourself, um, which you get to feel uh, you know, that you're contributing to. And so I saw that as being a perfect uh, opportunity or a vehicle for um, returning veterans uh, to use it as an opportunity to kind of transition back um, from deployment um, without having to kind of uh, hit the ground running into regular life, because it's certainly not uh, regular when you first get back. And I think that, and I hope that uh, potentially maybe just from this opportunity, that the vision is where the National Park and the Department of Interior and the DOD um, and then Cornell or uh, you know, Bass Pro Shops or um, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife all work together to, one, identify research needs. Um, and I'm sure there's places in all, all different nooks and crannies of our country that could use a couple extra hands collecting specimens or uh, just surveying, as you said, observation. And um, you know, I, think it's a, I think it's a perfect fit. And uh, the, like I said, the accessibility, the mobility is awesome. And we do need an army, and uh, that's why Soldiers to Scientists uh, is there to um, kind of fill that gap a little bit. And what I think is really interesting is the, <clears throat> the democratization of science, um, the full scope of that, and putting the power of scientific process and inquiry into, you know, a community sense. Um, you know, we're just yet flushing that out. So I'm just really, uh, really thankful to be part of it. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, next, I'd like to call on Dolores Hill from NASA Osiris Rex, an Osiris Rex mission, target asteroids. You think we're safe for today? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you very much. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give a shout out to my colleagues and co-lead, uh, Carl Hergenrother and Dr. Anna Spitz. Um, <laughs> Ten years from now, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft will return a precious payload to the Utah desert. Its arrival will herald the U.S.'s first asteroid sample return, and citizen scientists can be a part of that program today. Target Asteroids is an exciting program to enlist amateur astronomers uh, to track near-Earth asteroids and support spacecraft missions with their observations. Building on the foundations of amateur astronomy, it expands the role of citizen scientists in cutting-edge asteroid research and puts them at the forefront in the efforts to learn more about asteroids and protect our planet. They provide valuable data to help scientists characterize near-Earth asteroids and understand the process by which main belt asteroids may become near-Earth asteroids. Uh, essential steps to ascertaining the risk of impact with Earth uh, that affects the world's inhabitants. Carl Hergenrother selects near-Earth asteroids that are easily accessible by sample return spacecraft or are analogs to our target, Bennu. Observers acquire asteroid images and make precise measurements of positions and brightnesses whenever they are able and submit those uh, via the internet. Many observations are combined over a wide range of orbital positions and every observation is important. One of the biggest challenges to our program is that some of the asteroids on our list are dark and faint, like our target. Uh, our observers rise to the challenge to capture images. Some don't own telescopes, but use remote telescopes in other parts of the world. Those with small telescopes concentrate on bright objects on our list. Uh, we've had a very successful program in our only our first year with 138 participants. We have nine program partners uh, that help us uh, bring expertise to support the program and leverage NASA and private resources. Uh, we look forward to expanding our program uh, and the benefits of target asteroids extends to all of humanity now and in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Dolores. Next, uh, Sandra Henderson will talk about the NEON Project Bud Burst. Sandra. Thank you. I'm 
here today because every plant tells a story. And in Project Budburst, participants capture those stories and share them with others. What I'd really like to do right now is gather all of you up, go outside onto the White House gardens, and let's find out the stories that those plants can make and tell us. But I'm guessing, uh, Joan, that would greatly exceed my <laughs> allotted time. So we're going to have to come inside and think about how we would make phenological observations of plants. Are you with me? We can do it inside, can't we? Let's do it. Yeah. Let's yeah. Do it. Oh, but wait, I do see a puzzled look or two out there. Maybe not everyone knows what a phenological observation is. So let's think about this for a minute. OK, those of you in DC, have you ever noticed the cherry trees in the spring when they start to flower? Anyone ever notice those? Yeah. How about other parts of the country, lilacs, when they first come into bloom and flower? Leaves come out? Yes. If you have noticed plants leafing, flowering, or fruiting, you have just made a phenological observation, and you are fully qualified to become part of Project Budburst. <laughs> And that's what Project Budburst is all about. We're an online community engaging people from all walks of life, all 50 states, in making phenological observations um, of plants. Because plants do have a lot of stories to tell us. Why? Why are plants important? Well, it turns out plants are everywhere pretty much that we are. And plants also respond in pretty predictable ways to changing in changes in their environment. Day length, for example or um, changes in precipitation and temperature. And these are things that climate scientists are extremely interested in knowing. So just think of the power. If we could get people from all over the country, every one of us here, occupants of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, everyone, just making plant observations, joining Project Budburst, and adopting a plant. You want to talk about flower power. I think we'd be there. So, so. Um, but the real power, and it was mentioned earlier, villages and armies, the real power, and in Project Budburst, we need villages. We need our villagers. We need armies of villagers and villages and villagers. Whoa, let's stop there right now, Sandra. Because we need this to paint that more complete picture of how plants are responding to ch climate change, and that gives us insight. We better understand our natural world. So uh, our part, our, the real power of Project Budburst is working with partners. We work with partners in wildlife refuges. We work with partners in museums, certainly in Chicago uh, in Botanic Gardens, Chicago Botanic Garden being our primary partner. And I'm delighted being in DC to um, announce our newest botanical partner, and that's the US Botanic Garden. So it's pretty exciting. Go to our website. Check us out. Better yet, join us. And what we're really hoping that uh, in coming years, we're going to see your observations, observations from people all across the country. They are making a difference. We are getting scientific publications out of these. And let's just hope maybe we'll even see some from the White House before too long. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I'm, I'm stunned. I mean, I want to go out and look at a plant now. Yes. <laughs> My wife will find this hilarious. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Gregory Gage to talk about backyard brains. All right. Thank you, Joe. Uh, first of all, I want to start off by saying that I'm here to accept this award, but uh, I'm accepting on behalf of my co-founder, Tim Marzullo, and the rest of the hardworking people at Backyard Brains who couldn't be here today. Um, and the idea of citizen science is, is very personal to me. I was an engineer, and I worked for many years <clears throat> after I got my electrical engineering degree at Michigan State, uh, just doing circuits and doing this type of stuff. I always liked science, but I always thought science was just a collection of facts and the stuff that you read. And I always liked to read about those facts, but I never really thought, you know, I could have a career where I actually, you know, gathered and created those facts myself. It just never dawned on me. Uh, and when I was, I was living in Europe and I saw a flyer on the wall that said there was a, a public lecture uh, for astronomers to come out and they would talk about their research. And that was the f first time, it was like many years after I graduated from the university that I realized that I could become a scientist because I would talk to these people afterwards and I thought what they were doing was super cool. And so uh, that I, I instantly changed the careers. I, I quit my job. I went back to graduate school. It was a big shock for my family who was out there. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and so one of the things I, I did with my lab mates is, is we'd go out to schools and we'd, you know, tell them what we were doing as scientists. And like, I'd always try to like press that, you know, you can do this as a career. If you like doing Sudoku and all this type of stuff, you might be interested in doing this type of stuff. Uh, and so, uh, but one of, the thing, one of the challenges we had is, is we're doing really awesome stuff in the neuroscience lab that I was in. I, I chose neuroscience as a, as a career. 
but we couldn't do that in the classroom. And so um, we came up with a self-imposed engineering challenge to sort of replace $40,000 worth of lab equipment and make it cheap enough and easy enough that you can use it down to the fifth grade level. And so uh, for the past four years, we've been developing neuroscience experiments and tools and technologies that allow kids to actually record the living brain of, the, of insects. And so uh, just to be really brief about what it is that we do, uh, we have 100 billion cells in our brain called neurons. These neurons communicate with each other using electricity in a very pulse called a spike. Uh, and this spike travels down from one cell to the other. And you can actually listen to that. This electricity that you can actually plug into so you can amplify that. And you can start to do like university level uh, experiments down into, into, into the fifth grade classroom. You can learn about a somatotopy, you know, like rate coding, like neuropharmacology, all these types of stuff that you normally have to go to graduate school for, but now you can start doing it early because one out of five of us is going to have a neurological disorder. So it's a bit of a shame that we're not like teaching these tools a bit earlier in life. And so that's what uh, Backyard Brains is here to do. So thank you very much. Well, brief, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. We're going to now turn the panel, the program back over to Joan, and I'd like to ask this panel to grab your name tags, okay. go back to your seats, and we'll do a transition in just a moment. Thanks, number one panel. Thank you. This is frustrating. It makes me want to clone myself into 12 entities and volunteer on each project. Um, it's very frustrating, very exciting. Um, it's my pleasure. Uh, so thank you very much, champions. And I want to thank Joe for, for moderating the first panel. And I also, before I forget, want to remind audience members again, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So if you don't have a card, Amanda Rubin over there has some cards. If you have uh, some blank cards that you, she'll distribute if you raise your hand. And if you have some questions already written on the cards that you do have, please raise your hand and, and hand them down to her. We really want to have a, a lively Q&A, a give and take at the, at the end of the program today. Um, our next speaker is Ellen McCauley. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Ellen. She's a program director for the Advancing Informal Science Learning Program at the National Science Foundation. Originally trained as a tropical ecologist, Ellen has worked across the field of informal science education in botanical gardens, natural history museums, science television, museum administration, and at a national centers. Uh, at national centers, Ellen has participated in and published on citizen science extensively. And I encourage you to, to Google her and, and read some of her papers. She now manages many of the Nas National Science Foundation's investments in citizen science. So Ellen, if you want to come on up. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you, Joan. Thank you to the White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy for calling attention to the far-reaching contributions of citizen science to our nation's understanding of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and to lifelong science learning. I am particularly delighted to speak at this event as I have the pleasure of serving as the National Science Foundation Program Officer for three of today's honorees, Julia Parrish, Karen Oberhauser, and Leanne Rodriguez. Sandra Henderson's work, as you've already heard, is also receiving National Science Foundation funding. Thus, on behalf of the National Science Foundation, I add my congratulations to all 12 of you, of you champions of change. You are individuals here who are honored because of your innovation and exemplary contributions to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and to, the engineer, and to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics learning in this nation. I was asked to speak briefly about citizen science and why our collective efforts to engage and support volunteers in public participation in scientific research is so critical. Briefly, citizen science involves the public, people of all ages, from all walks of life, most of whom have not had formal science training or even experience. And they directly participate in authentic research in order to investigate scientific questions 
and generate new scientific knowledge. The efforts of the Champions of Change honorees here today, as well as those of their colleagues near and far, represent hundreds of citizen science programs and tens of thousands of citizen science participants. As such, they illustrate that citizen science pro projects include a great diversity of science content, from asteroids and the chemistry of space to invasive plants and the folding of DNA, from rain, hail, and snow to water quality and human health, from erosion on beaches to bird migration. Yes, citizen science is burgeoning right now, and we better catch up and hold on. And this is true that citizen science is burgeoning because of the dedication of the scientists and the volunteers. And we're supported by the cyber technology and its applications that are specifically designed to facilitate data collection and management, as well as the social media that connects the scientists and volunteers and promote timely and effective communication. So I have two messages about citizen science to offer today and they can be summed up in one sentence. Citizen science programs are integral to the national scientific endeavor because they result in both new scientific knowledge generation and participants learning science. First, let me speak a moment about citizen science leading to scientific knowledge generation. Many of our questions about nature, the environment, health, and space require rigorous data to be collected from across the vastness of our planet and the skies, and to collect that data over extended periods of time, years, if not decades, or more. Without public participation in scientific research, it would be nearly impossible for scientists to amass this data due to geographic and temporal constraints. We need public participation in scientific data collection and contributing data. To date, Hundreds of peer-reviewed publications, scientific publications, as well as countless science-informed decisions have been based on citizen science efforts. Second, because of NSF-funded research and the research of others, we now know that participating in citizen science leads to people learning science. Okay, so that isn't surprising to you and me, but we have the data to document that now. And what better way to learn science than to participate in actual scientific research? Depending on the project, volunteers can participate into up to every step of the scientific knowledge generation process, from asking questions, to designing studies, to collecting, analyzing, interpreting, and visualizing data. And most importantly, People are now sharing and publishing what they've learned in scientific publications as well as using that information to make decisions for their lives and their community. Whether it is understanding the impacts of massive storms and and on the beaches of Manatee, Puerto Rico, to alerting authorities that there are birds washing up on the shores of the West Coast in unusual numbers, to monitoring monarch butterfly larvae in order to understand population dynamics and migration as these tiny creatures travel from Mexico to Minnesota, citizen science invites people to participate in doing authentic research, scientific research, and to connect with others, scientists and volunteers, as they learn science. So what's the future look like? It's exciting, and we're all going to be a part of it. Cutting-edge research and practice in informal science education focuses on increasing opportunities for more diverse publics to participate in citizen science. It also challenges researchers and practitioners to better understand how to increase the impacts of these experiences, the positive impacts of these experiences on the participants as well as the scientific knowledge generation process. And the other challenge is to leverage cutting-edge cyber technology to interpret big data resulting from citizen science. So with citizen science programs in school and out of school, for old people and young people and everyone in between, I am, I am confident in the continued leadership of this country in the success 
of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Thank you to the White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy for calling attention to the far-reaching contributions and the continued promise of citizen science to the well-being of our nation. And today, congratulations to today's 12 champions of change. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, for that. Uh, there is, it's amazing what, it, what happens when you participate in a science project. My own career before I started in journalism began in science, and just briefly, I was a, a visiting a freshman in college and visiting a friend at Stanford, and they needed a place to stay. And so what do you do when you need a place to stay and you're visiting a friend in college? You stay in the sleep lab that the college dorm <laughs> resident had in the basement. And I, I was a sleep research subject uh, my first night at Stanford, and that got me interested in sleep research, which I then pursued as a PhD career. So you never know, right? <laughs> Can I invite the second panel to come up, and we'll continue on with the program. And, and I just want to encourage the second panel to do as good a job at sticking to time as the first panel, because they were awesome. And you, your challenge has been thrown down. <laughs> and Margaret Gordon, since you're nearby, I'd like you to be first at the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Margaret Gordon. I'm from West Oakland, from uh, Oakland, California. Um, I got involved in environmental justice as a second career and dealing with the issues uh, from my community called the Port of Oakland. And we have trucks, trains, ships, cargo handling equipment in this neighborhood 24-7. And, and when I moved in the neighborhood 21 years ago, I was um, going to my son's the elementary school and I saw a basket of inhalers at the nurse's office. And I want to know why there were so many inhalers. And she was talking about all these kids have asthma. And nobody was really talking about the issue of, of quality of life, of health issues within the neighborhood. So moving forward, um, the Pacific Institute is a think tank um, within Oakland, came to the neighborhood and started doing a series of, of neighborhood meetings called indicators and I learned how to, about measuring stuff. And I never thought that understanding how to measure stuff and measure quality of life issues as such as air quality, truck traffic, uh, understanding where trucks were going to come and from going, having parking, uh, all these different things was about how our community was being impacted or overburdened with this industry. So, Part of my, so as I learned all these things, I also learned the health impacts of the community. We had high asthma, cancers, lung disease, lung disease, and nobody was really talking about these things. So, what, so a group of us came together and we developed our own organization called the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. And we started off with 250 things that were impacted in the neighborhood, uh, uh, drilled it down prior, by prioritization of 17 things, and those 17 things we have used as a campaign or advocacy tool to identify these uh, quality, of, uh, quality of life issues within the community. And, up to, and then three years ago, um, Intel had a prototype, um, um, a prototype lab in Berkeley, and somebody had heard that the work that we were, we were doing, and they brought a dust tracker to the neighborhood. So when we got this dust tracker, we didn't, I had no idea what this, the power of this, this dust, dust tracker would do. We were able to start measuring our own air quality and analyzing it to an industry who just has totally disregarded a community called the shipping businesses. So we were able to work to show them the impacts of this business on our community. And so that's how I didn't know by having my own lab equipment have my own instrument, and then training other residents. This was called citizen science. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Margaret. Now can I ask Karen Oberhauser of the Monarch Larva Butter Monitoring Project to come on up. Thank you, Joe. I would like to start by thanking all of the Monarch citizen scientists who nominated me for this award, many of whom are in the audience today. I run a project called, like Joe said, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, but really there are about a dozen citizen science projects focused on monarch butterflies. So this talk is really for the entire monarch citizen science community. It's not just about my project. When I think of citizen science, I think of points spreading out over a map, filling that map with new knowledge. And my talk today is going to think about the things that really interest me when I think of citizen science, and that's the scientific, the educational, and the conservation value of citizen science. From an educational perspective, as we've heard today, citizen science allows us to address questions at spatial and temporal scales that would be completely impossible if scientists were just going out and collecting data on their own. Citizen scientists provide data on these huge scales and their data are being used. My colleague Leslie Reese from the University of Maryland is doing an analysis of all of the scientific papers published on, on monarch butterflies since 1990. And there are a lot of papers on monarchs. Over half of the papers in the scientific literature that focus on monarch migration and movement, monarch population dynamics, and monarch natural enemies use data that had been collected by citizen scientists, which is a pretty amazing to think about. One of the natural enemies papers is based on questions asked by a monarch citizen science, Ilse Gebhardt, who's in the audience today, who raised thousands and thousands of monarch caterpillars, and along with her citizen scientist colleagues, Charlie Cameron from North Carolina and Sandy Oberhauser from Wisconsin, published a paper documenting rates of parasitism by a tachinid fly called Lespizia archipivora. Now that is the power of citizen science. <laughs> As an example of the educational benefits, I'd like to describe a student named Josh Prohl, who was a fifth grader in New London, Minnesota. And Josh took part in a project that we run at the University of Minnesota that's called Driven to Discover in which we use citizen science projects that are based either on monarch butterflies or birds. I know a little bit about other things, not just monarchs. Um, we use these as springboards for independent research for youth that engage with adult leaders. Josh studied a monarch disease called Ophriocystis electroscura, or you could say that 10 times fast tonight before you go to sleep, um, or OE, you can also say OE for short. Josh, the next summer, attended a meeting of scientists and, mon and citizen scientists where he met Dr. Sonia Altizer, who's the world's authority on OE. Josh and Sonia talked as colleagues, and um, Josh, so Josh had the opportunity to communicate with a scientist, and he continued to study OE. That's the power of citizen science. And I'd like to end just by saying that citizen scientists, as we've heard, are, can become an army for conservation. But it's important that citizen science isn't just a tool for documenting declines in, in butterfly or bird or native plant pop populations. Aldo Leopold once said, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on land is quite invisible to laymen, end quote. Citizen science not only makes these wounds visible to many more people, but it can help to heal them. That is the power of citizen science. Thank you. The only thing ma that makes me nervous is actually saying those Latin names that you managed. <laughs> I'm glad that, well. I don't think it's a requirement that if you want to join the project, you have to be able to say those things. Um, next, I'd like to call on John Roden from the National Audubon Society. John. Thanks. <clears throat> um, I have to savor the moment. It's not often you get invited to say a few words at the White House. <laughs> um, 
I work for the National Audubon Society, which uh, you may not know uh, actually coordinates one of the longest running citizen science projects in the world, which is the Christmas Bird Count. Uh, it started in 1900, and uh, it's basically worldwide in scope now. And uh, one of the interesting things is that Audubon scientists have actually been able to investigate those data to look at how bird populations are responding to climate change. So there are um, data sets, Julia's um, data set is, is starting to show this sort of stuff, but this is 113 years of data that we've actually been able to look at how bird populations are responding to climate change. And I think that, especially in light of the President's remarks today, I think we're, you know, obviously climate change is coming up in a lot of um, the citizen science talks. I don't specifically work in the Christmas bird count. I actually have, uh, most of my citizen science work has been focused in New York City where I've worked to get inhabitants of all five boroughs involved in scientific research so that we can better understand how the urban environment affects bird populations as they're uh, transiting that environment. And I, um, I, I, you know, it's, Karen's a tough act to follow, and she hit so many of the points that are really important in this discussion, but I just wanted to focus a little bit on the stories of some of the people that have participated in the, in the work that I've done because we have learned a lot through their participation in what's going on with birds in the city, but I think that some of the most powerful uh, uh, effects for the program have been on the people that have participated. So we've reached out to the deaf and hard of hearing community as an, as an audience that we don't typically include, and all of the trainings that I have and all of the monitoring that we do is interpreted for the deaf, and that has had a real a positive uh, impact on getting uh, new people involved in the, in the efforts. Uh, I also did a project that was focused on uh, Second Chance High School in the Bronx called the Satellite Academy and getting kids from that school involved in our monitoring of uh, shorebirds in the Bronx River Estuary. And in fact, there are plenty of shorebirds in the Bronx River Estuary. And just one quick story about a, a student named Josh, another Josh, who um, actually came into the program not knowing, not caring anything about birds. And we trained him in how to collect scientific data rigorously, and he would go out with me and collect data on the shorebirds. And one day he brought in um, his phone and he said, John, I was hanging out with some friends the other day and we, there was a bird. We saw a bird and we had no idea what it was. And he said, I know that John will know what it is. He took a picture of it and he brought it in and showed it to me. And it was a gray cat bird. You know, a beautiful little uh, migratory songbird. And uh, so I told him what it was. We went over and looked at it up. We looked it up on the computer. He entered his observation in eBird, which is an online data portal, which is another great citizen science tool. And it was very few observations in the Bronx uh, of that. And, um, and actually texted all his friends what he had seen. So, so it's just an example of a kid that had no interest in this, but he actually started paying attention and it started piquing his curiosity about, it, about the natural world. And I think that that's really important. Citizen science, as Karen said, has the power to do that. Thanks. Thanks, John. Next, I'd like to call on Leanne Rodriguez of the Conservation Trust of Puerto Rico. Good morning. My name is Leanne Rodriguez. I work at the Conservation Trust of Puerto Rico at a newly created unit called Para la Naturaleza, and our mission is to secure land of great ecological value. And we have a very ambitious goal of protecting 33% of our land by the year 2033. We know that to achieve that goal, we have to create alliances, collaborations, but most of all, we have to engage the public. And that's where citizen science comes in for us. Around five years ago, we were granted an award by the National Science Foundation, and we had our great team represented here today by our champions, Sandra Faria and Astrid Maldonado, who recruited more than 2,500 individuals of all walks of lives, all ages, to come in and participate in over 600 hands-on STEM and nature-related activities. And they gave us more than 25,000 hours of their time. And we had a great retention rate. We had more than 1,000 people come in time over time to contribute to our project. And our champion, Citizen Science, is sitting here in the back row. His name is Willy Burgos. And he contributed to our project something that we had not planned, that we had not foreseen. He created and designed the first field guide on land crabs for Puerto Rico with the researcher. And on his own, he went and created a guidebook, an illustrated guidebook of all the crabs that we have in Puerto Rico. 
that was not even in our outcomes or deliverables in our planned things. So we were like, wow, that's really cool. How can we continue to create citizen science like Willie? So now we are purposely assessing our process, the experience the researchers and the participants go through to see if we can build a model that we can replicate that experience. In my opinion, there are certain factors that come to play for that. For instance, citizen science has given our organization the opportunity to be inclusive, to be open-minded and flexible, and to be synergistic. And to us, it's a no-brainer. Now we're applying citizen science across the board in all of our programs. For instance, we are using it in a project for the reintroduction of an endangered species, which is funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We are using it for a champing of tree competition funded by the Forest Service. We are using it for eBird. Thank you, John. We are also using it for our community outreach and beach cleanup projects funded by NIFWIF. And we have the private sector also supporting us. We have Pfizer Pharmaceuticals and AT&T helping us in our program, Map of Life Landscape Inventory Program. So we've been able to apply citizen science across the board. And to us, citizen science means connections. It has helped us to connect people to one another, people to science, most of all, people to nature. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leanne. And next, uh, Ariel Waldman will tell us about Science Hack Day, right? Thank you. Um, I often really enjoy looking at pictures of Earth as seen from space. Space exploration often changes our view of ourselves and our place in the universe. But similarly, I think we should change how we view science and space exploration. The relationship that most of us have with science and space exploration is one of observation. We're often observing astronauts or government agencies exploring on behalf of us, but we ourselves aren't doing much exploring. And this sort of relates to my own personal story. Because back in 2008, I was watching a documentary on the Discovery Channel called When We Left Earth. And it was this great documentary about NASA during the early days. And I became so inspired by this documentary that I decided to send someone at NASA an email on a whim saying that I was a huge fan of uh, everything they were doing. And if they ever needed someone like me, uh, someone without a formal science background, my degree was in graphic design, that I was here. Uh, it was totally a fangirl moment, and I never really expected to hear back from them. <laughs> But serendipitously, I was able to get a job at NASA from this email, and it completely changed my life. And I got to learn so many things at NASA. But one of the most important things I ended up learning was that I actually didn't even need to work at NASA to explore space. And so I left. <laughs> um, <laughs> but shortly after, I created uh, spacehack.org, which is a directory of ways for anyone to participate in space exploration, anything from discovering galaxies to building robots and so on. And when I built this, I became frustrated that there was actually a lot of open science stuff out there, but no one was doing anything interesting with it. And so born out of this frustration came an event called Science Hack Day. And Science Hack Day is a 48-hour event in which scientists, designers, developers, and all different types of people get into the same physical space to see what they can rapidly prototype with science in 24 consecutive hours. This is really just around the mission of getting excited and making things with science. And my favorite story from Science Hack Day was one where we had someone who wanted to create a, a device that would detect when he needed to shave, essentially a beer detector. <laughs> so this person hacked together this USB microscope, and he held it up to his face and was able to see the lines on his face. And I thought this was amusing, but I wasn't quite sure what it had to do with science. But sitting in the audience and seeing this uh, device uh, demoed was a particle physicist. And when the particle physicist saw this, he thought to himself, wow, that's actually a genius way for how to detect cosmic rays in a cloud chamber. <laughs> <laughs> Which is ridiculous, but following Science Hack Day, this particle physicist wrote up this entire proposal for how to detect cosmic rays in a cloud chamber using the original code and open computer vision library someone had used to detect if he needed to shave or not. <laughs> And so this is what I really love uh, about hacking uh, science and space exploration. It's really just about uh, creating sparks for future ideas and future collaborations. And to me, when it comes to space exploration, you could be searching for a lot of things, extraterrestrials or exoplanets. 
But to me, it's really the search for experimentation that's so incredibly precious. And I think we've found it through hacking science and hacking space exploration. Thank you. Thanks, Ariel. I have to confess, I had another one of those momentary confusions. I thought she was talking about a beer detector, <laughs> um, which would also be useful, I think. Um, <laughs> our last speaker is Jason Osborne of Shark Find. Hi, I'm uh, Jason Osborne. I'm the uh, co-founder of PaleoQuest, and I'd like to talk to you about Shark Finder, which is managed by citizen science scientists. It's also, up to this point, has been funded by citizen scientists, and citizen scientists are also reporting and publishing on the data from Shark Finder. So just to give you a little bit of a background uh, on the project itself, my dear friend, co-founder, of PaleoQuest, Aaron Alfred and I, have actually had this unique skill set. We were able to go into fossil formations that are poorly characterized, identify these formations, and actually make them productive. Productive, productive to the point that we have multiple new species, uh, in some cases, uh, new genus of new species. So we decided to take this talent and go to the, from micro or macro level to micro level. And we knew that from our paleo uh, uh, buddies, and, and uh, we were told that the micro, on the micro scale, our yield for new stories or new species and new occurrence of species, and what I mean by new occurrence of species, it's a known species, but it's new to the geological formation and the geological space, or our geographical location. So, <clears throat> What we did is we actually went and targeted one of these poorly characterized formations, and uh, we took some samples into the University of Maryland where we met Dr. Brett Kent. And Brett Kent is a elasma branch specialist. And elasma branches are sharks, rays, and skates. And since Aaron and I are really uh, interested in marine deposits along the coastal plain of the United States, the magnitude of Elasma branch fossils were, was just astonishing in the material that we were searching. Not only that, the material that we were looking at was, was so exquisite to anything that they had found before that the possibilities of finding new occurrences and new species were, were just, it was is inevitable. The problem is it takes forever to go through micro samples, so we needed citizen scientists. So what, about, what better place to go than in our school system? So we actually had attacked Seven, seven schools or seven states in the system, school systems within those seven states and pushed Shark Finder through their school systems. And the amazing thing is, this is the juicy details, uh, is the result of the material that we sent to these schools had led to nine publications in process, and this is less than, or a little over a year time. So anybody that's in the science community, nine publications in a, in a little over a year is astonishing. There's 50, 50 plus students and counting that will be credited and actually cited for their work in scientific publications. Um, also, uh, the, their, all, of their, all of their fossils and stuff will be in, in, uh, curated in a museum called the Calvert Marine Museum, which is led by uh, Stephen Godfrey. And uh, just imagine if we were able to, now this was about 1,000 students, there's 200 of you in here, so that would be equivalent if you could do the math, 10 of you would actually have a first occurrence of a new species. Uh, imagine if we can tackle 1 million students, 5 million students, 10 million students, and we were able to push this through their school systems, the questions that we can answer like marine diversity, evolution, and climate change. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jason. And, and now we're going to, I mean, first of all, I'd like to give a very sincere thanks to both panels for sticking to time. And I suppose, and I was just thinking about this, it's not, usually when I moderate panels, people, time is not a, a, a variable people are very good with. But I suppose a bunch of science 
and citizen scientists would be good at it because timing is a very important element to uh, scientific endeavor. And when you want to study the pH change over an hour, you don't want to do it over an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so thank you, panels. Can I invite the first panel to grab their name tags and sit on the apron here? And we're going to have a Q&A session where Joan is going to hand me cards that I hope you've written. Or if you haven't yet, raise your hand and get a card. Or raise your hand and someone will collect your card. And provided you haven't said anything nasty or untoward, <laughs> and provided I can read your handwriting, I will uh, ask the questions and we'll get the panel. And here, I have one idea. Let's give you guys a microphone. Yeah. Sorry, Margaret. So I think you can share. You might have to move around. I'm sorry about the logistics. I would have brought a microphone if I'd known. Uh, OK, are we ready with questions? Everybody comfortable? It's very casual. OK. Question number one, what scientific fields provide for natural opportunities for citizen scientists? Um, I'll invite anybody to ask that, but since we've heard, it sounds like just about anything. Maybe the question is what scientific fields aren't uh, viable? But are there any that have been missed so far? Let's put it that way. Certainly natural. You, no, I, I think, uh, grab the microphone so that people can hear. And I, I think <laughs> the... Um, Historically, it's been the biological sciences, like, uh, but it, that's starting to change now. I think with the with the tools, technologies that are becoming available for citizens to get involved with that. I think for you know for hundreds of years, like like a telescope, you could go out and buy a cheap telescope, and you could use that. Or in mathematics, there's been a lot of like, citizen science for the history of, of adding to that. But I think the 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 softer uh, biological sciences are just starting to come online right now. Okay, I like to. Yeah, I'd like to just add to that, that citizen science, by its very definition, needs to catch the attention of people who aren't necessarily trained in science. And I think what we've seen today is that any kind of science can capture the attention of everyone, or of, of so many people, so that really any field is, is, is inherently interesting to people, so they're willing to volunteer their time in it, P things that are that have meaning to them, like the projects that Margaret talked about that, that have, you know, meaning, kind of life and death meaning to people, or just interest in the natural world. There are many, anything goes. Karen, since you raised my name, I will say that people need to be able to use this science to about change of life, looking at disparities, looking like at quality of life, understanding the problem solving of of communities that are impacted. I think that is something that's really uh, un, un new to, to science and that uh, science being um, partnering with, com with those communities being able to give their own testimony to their experience, daily, their experience of what's been happening in their communities. I would like to add that our projects have several ecological studies, but we do have one archaeological study, so it is applicable to all types of disciplines. And we do engage children as young as nine years. We've had um, seniors, 92, ripe years old, come in and participate with us. So it's really applicable to any type of science and any type of community or community member. Eric, go ahead. There's not a very clear definition of science. So there's a lot of people who are curious and who are tracking data in their own lives or in their kitchen, like somebody who wants to cook the perfect steak or bake awesome cupcakes. There's a lot of science involved, but people don't see it that way. And a lot of times I've gone and talked to people, just said I'm working in open science or citizen science, and sometimes they get this physical reaction like, oh, wait, don't talk to me about that, I'm not a scientist. And <laughs> I think, sorry, uh, the definition around science should be broadened and made more public. Science communication is really crucial to this effort. and giving people the feeling of empowerment is really important because once you tell people that they're doing science or introduce them into a lab, there is some fear there and apprehension. And a lot of what can make them stay is culture. It's just being nice and making them feel like this is something that you can do using the right language um, is really important. And I think when I see these champions of change, you see that they're using the language that really appeals to people, not one that says, oh, this is hard and you can't do it. Because everybody can do it and they do it. And so uh, we should just recognize that when we see it in uh, everyday life. I'll just, are we okay? 
I, I want, there's another question here, which I think is a very interesting one, and I, I'm curious to hear what the panels think about it. How do you ensure that the data that everyday citizens capture, I'll correct this, are accurate? <laughs> Boy, you just uh, asked probably whoever asked that question. That's one of the toughest ones and the challenges or opportunities we face in citizen science. How do we know the data is good quality? Um, well, there's a lot of ways to ensure good data quality. Part of it is the uh, instructional materials you provide, the direction you provide to your participants. You have things, if you're an online program, have some automatic feedback, some automatic testing. Get to know who your participants are. Have them rate themselves. What is their le level of expertise and comfort in these areas? Um, we're going to be working this summer uh, at NEON with our NEON scientists who are also doing plant phenology in the field. We'll be doing some comparisons. We're looking always to raise the confidence and lower the error bars. But it is a challenge I think everybody at this uh, panel would agree is something we're all committed to taking on and uh, we'll be sharing more about it in coming years. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we'll, start with the, we'll stay with the front row for a minute. Okay. Uh, speaking of error bars, that, that's one way that we ensure that we have good data. Um, many observations are combined into uh, one graph, and the more observations we have, the more accurate we are. Uh, sometimes we might only have a single observation that is critical, uh, and we always look for more. So we encourage our observers to get out there and observe as often as they can. Good idea. <laughs> Come to the microphone. The microphone won't come to you. So in COAST, um, every single data point that is collected uh, is done in such a way that it's deductive. That is, people collect evidence and they use that evidence to make a deduction. And in that case, it's what species is in front of me. And because we do it that way, independent experts can also use that same evidence to come to the same conclusion. And so every single piece of evidence is independently verifiable. And that is a standard that we use because our data goes into a court of law. It's the baseline against which an oil spill uh, can be assessed. And that level of rigor is higher than graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the methods that I've, I've used is that I have partnered with an agency. So it could be an air quality agency, a US EPA, mm -hmm. uh, a state air quality agency, and have uh, helped, they supported the community to design the methodology that they were going to use to organize the project. So like we did a traffic study and counting trucks, and we did we use a truck traffic uh, uh, technical or, uh, uh, organization that came in and worked with us to identify how many trucks were coming through our neighborhood, what kind of trucks they were, and we had and we, you, and we worked in partnership with uh, our local Bay Area air quality to establish the, uh, the, our, our findings. So, so, they were, so that's, one, that's how communities like West Oakland and our low income communities, you partner, you, partner, you work in collaboration with an a agency uh, and also support the idea of how to ch take that science, go into a policy around an uh, industry like trucks, trains, cargo trains, ships, and so forth. So that's how we have used the, uh, our data, qualify our data. In our case, um, we invest quite a amounts of time and money and resources in training our volunteers. So we do have a core of volunteer leaders, and it's a trickle-down effect. So they become the mentors of the new citizen scientists coming on board in any of our projects. And we do use, speaking a bit to what Margaret just said, protocols that have already been validated and used by other agencies or scientific community. So we are ensuring that the data that is coming in is accurate. And then we, of course, we have a quality control within our organization that is always um, looking at the data and making sure that there are no huge mistakes in it. So okay. I, just, just to add, I think that, um, you know, I guess with, with a democracy, it gets, it, it, there's a potentiality for it to get a little sloppy at times. And so, you know, um, it's important to have the protocols and the, and the checks. Um, but what I think it also, the one point I would add is that uh, there's a, the whole process of enjoying an outdoor activity or enjoying a hobby or enjoying a different aspect of nature, there is this process of increasing returns. 
Uh, the more you do, the more you learn, the more you know, mm -hmm. the more the process allows for you to engage it more. You can get more out of it the more you do it. And I think that those that come to a certain point and cross over to the citizen science, to a citizen scientist, have brought themselves to a certain level of awareness and um, education. And then once they join with the communities and with others with the, the protocols and, and the, you know, the structure, the vehicle, which uh, these, you know, your, uh, the programs and, and others uh, provide for someone that, you know, is out in the nether space of the internet but wants to get more involved, um, it's, uh, I think that's where, that, that's where, uh, I'm kind of losing my train of thought, but I just wanted to add that. I think that it's important that uh, the process itself, um, you know, kind of enables that education and enables the individual to kind of understand a, a bit more. So. Karen, did you want to add something? Yeah, we've, we've heard a lot about all of the different ways that we all use to make sure that the data are accurate because it's very important to us as the leaders of these projects, but I'd like just to add that citizen scientists are volunteering their, their time to collect these data. And most citizen scientists are very invested in making sure that their time is well spent. So in some ways that question kind of annoys me because when we think of the way scientific data are collected, often you know, it's not the hotshot scientists who are actually collecting the data, it's undergraduates who might be paying, getting paid 10 bucks an hour. And the, the time that citizen scientists are putting into this project means that they really care about the data. So I might turn that question around and say that citizen science data, as long as all of these different checks and balances are in place, are likely to be even more accurate than whatever, you know, traditional scientific data. I have to agree with that. I'll just leave it to I think part of my science is to be able to give the, the mother who has to sit up all night long when a child has asthma, understanding why in this neighborhood this, this amount of kids have this many problems or need treatment. Why does this child have to use uh, uh, asthma machine all, all the time? So I'm, I'm, my thing is to make sure that when a new, a new developmental project is coming into the community, I don't care if it's a freeway, a new housing development, that that mother has the power to be able to go before city council, any of the agencies to test, give testimony about what her issue is, why is she, why is this in my neighborhood, and why, and what you, what she thinks they should be doing to change operations or practices inside the neighborhood. So this, she will not have to lose sleep, time for work, kid out of school. So it's a, it's a, it's a. Um, the science also have a methodology to write quality of life. So people need, so what, I think one of the things that people need to understand, everything is about somebody got to pay for it. On the front end or on the back end, when communities don't, such as West Oakland, do not have that type of uh, um, system set up, and you have to be able to make your own homegrown system to have people talk about their quality of life. Okay. I think I'd like to go on to the, the next question, which I think is an interesting one. It says, what is the most important thing you've learned that has allowed you to be so successful in engaging the public in your project? And by that, I think the question is, is it just a question of putting it there and if you build it, they will come? Or do you have to engage and promote and sell and what have you? So I, I'd be interested in the answer to that question. Yes, go ahead. We've been very successful in our first year of a decade-long project, mostly because we're able to engage our observers and uh, help them understand the importance of their observations. So they can be in their backyard and make a, a, an asteroid observation or take an image, and that's wonderful. But if they do it and they, they understand how they can actually help us track these things, um, they really feel they're, they're contributing uh, to an overall effort, and that's really important. Ariel, go ahead. Uh, for me, it's something where I think it, <laughs> I mostly just do things that I get excited about, and I happen to stumble upon finding out that other people get excited about the same thing. Um, it's not really about doing a lot of promotion. It's really just about yeah, this idea of just getting excited and, and making things and, and playing with science. And I'm less concerned about 
getting people to pursue degrees in science or, or having their whole lives pivot to, to do science. I, I think it's a lot more amazing to just get a bunch of people to play around with things and you know maybe it doesn't change their life, maybe they still don't really understand particle physics or something like that, but they can walk away from a weekend and say, you know, I don't really fully understand particle physics, but I played around with it once. And to me, that is enough of a sort of change uh, where people just feel like it's something they can play with, that uh, it's another fabric they can consider manipulating in their everyday work one day if it makes sense for them. And so it's really less about promotion or, or convincing people and, and more just about um, telling people it's just another fabric to manipulate or, or play with um, and just really have fun. Sandra, go ahead. Well, in Project Budburst, we like to say that uh, timing is everything. And for us, this is a pretty new project. We came out um, about 2007. We did a simple proof of concept to see if there was interest in a project um, looking at climate change and having plants give insight. Well, as you all know, I mean, climate change is an enormous topic, and we're going to hear more about it today. But climate change is also a very, can be a very scary uh, uh, project. It's a lot of unknowns. It's extremely complex, the interconnectedness. And doing something like Project Budburst is empowering. It gives people the opportunity to make some observations, share their observations. Their observations can and are making a difference, and they're not just sitting on the sidelines as um, passive um, rece receptors of the information. So for us, a lot of it was the timing and the interest in how to involve people in climate science uh, research. Like, yeah, go ahead. So I don't know about all of you, but I love to discover. So I think discovery is a huge aspect in citizen science. The other part is ownership. So when someone works with citizen science to have and be a part of that puzzle, whatever you're trying to figure out in the citizen science project, that sense of ownership is huge. And I think people want to contribute and want to be a part of citizen science and be a part of trying to figure out Earth's mysteries. And that ownership itself is its a huge, huge key. And in, in all of us in this panel, if we could provide that ownership, I think that's crucial. I'd like to add, put Joe, in one I more question. I, I'm sorry, I want to squeeze in one more question. I'll let you answer, the, answer it first. So, but my question, and several people have written this in, so I want to ask it since we're sitting here in Washington in the White House. Um, what more can federal agencies do? What, what, what kind of support do you need from them? And particularly, is there a, is there a part of the uh, spectrum, the 18 to 24-year-old uh, age group that's being missed, and how can federal agencies help capture that? So maybe you can... Well, I, I think I can at least tangentially address that. Sure. I mean, one, John, one, other, one other aspect of, I think, um, reaching people is making it relevant to them. And um, so that's meeting them where they are. You know? So in fact, if you are trying to reach the deaf and hard of hearing community, you need to make it accessible to them. If you want to meet, um, if you want people in the Bronx to be invested in what you're doing, you need to take it to them and, and ask questions that are relevant to them. And so I think that that gets at, you know, if we're missing at chunks of the population, be it 18 to 24 year olds, be it people of color, be it um, whatever, you, um, you need to take it to what they need. And there's, there's one um, uh, aspect of citizen science, um, you know, the way that we develop our projects. And there, there's from the contributory, like the Christmas bird count, to the co-created, where you're actually working with communities to develop their projects along the lines of what Margaret does. And I think that that's an important thing to recognize, is that that's an, a, a very important way to de as going forward as we develop citizen science projects to work more with communities to develop the project. Um, I, I want to add on the, the latter question that you said. One of the things that Washington, D.C. could do if you have an agency called USEPA, and that's supposed to be uh, Environmental Protection Agency, really do their job of protecting the people. Also, if you want this economic engine call of shipping and trade to happen, be more mindful of where people live, work, and play that's connected to that industry. So I'm so, and then if you put in public health inside some policy, carry out the public health mandates 
inside of your department. I see, I have, I have a problem with agencies saying we are doing environmental justice, we are doing public health, we are protecting the people, but they have no real policy mandate when it comes down to the local level. They can do a lot of stuff on the federal end, but nothing down to the, uh, down to the real community impacted end. So that's what, that's what DC could do for me. Okay. Well, I, I have a stack more questions, but I also know that we have no more time. So I'd like you once again to thank the panelists and congratulate yourselves. And I'm going to turn the program back to Joan Fry. You guys can go sit down. Uh, before everyone disperses, I want to add on behalf of the White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, thank everyone, thank our champions, and congratulate our champions again. Thank everyone in the audience and remotely for tuning in and, and celebrating with us today. Um, uh, there is a uh, brief, there will now be a brief break. And uh, I'm sorry, before I go into that, I also want to thank Ellen and Philip Rubin, Ellen McCauley and Philip Rubin for making their remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, we will be reconvening in the Indian Treaty Room, a lovely room on the fourth floor, room 474, for anyone who is interested in finding out what federal agencies are doing in new activities in the citizen science space. You are all welcome to join us. Uh, there will be, uh, this is a meet and greet, informal, no refreshments, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> meet and greet, informal opportunity to hear from five colleagues from the funding agencies, but also to, to chat with, um, with our champions and, and guests and audience members. 474, thank you very much. This concludes the program. Thank you.